Ciao, Papa. Sorry, everyone. The Pope keeps calling me. He's bored, you know, like a lot of people are. If elderly people call you, or an elderly person that you know perhaps is home alone, uh, please take the time to call them, you know, when people are sheltering in place. Uh, anyway, live from Vienna, Austria, it's Saturday morning. How is everybody? Over here in Vienna, we have been pretty much in lockdown uh, for two and a half weeks. So uh, I haven't spoken face to face, my friends, except for when I'm Zooming. Have you discovered Zoom yet? Uh, well, I discovered Zoom before it was cool to be using Zoom. I can say that, I was ahead of that curve. Anyway, uh, I have not spoken to a person live face to face for over two weeks now. So it's different, uh, but I'm okay. And I'm glad to reconnect with you lovely people today. I hope all of you are well. I hope you are washing your hands for 30 seconds. That's seven Jesus prayers, my friends, seven Jesus prayers while you're washing your hands. Uh, that makes for about 30 seconds. I hope you're airing the place out. When I go out for my power walk once a day, we are allowed to do that as long as you keep moving. They don't want you lounging about, you know, in the park areas, but you can go for a jog or for a walk. Anyway, for about an hour and a half, it takes me about an hour and 20 minutes. I open all the windows wide and I go out. So the place is aired out. That's a healthy thing to do. So says the CDC, the World Health Organization as well. These are some of the tips they give us. When you come back from anywhere, first thing you do is wash your hands, take off your shoes at the door as well. Um, before you touch anything, you know, be washing your hands. You should hopefully have a supply of hand cream. You don't want your skin to get all rough, right? Uh, during this time and chapped. So take care of your skin. Those are the tips that you've already heard elsewhere, but uh, I decided to offer them to you as well. Uh, everybody, I have a special guest for you today. He is a dear friend of mine, Father Kirill Ravarun. He is a cleric of the Moscow Patriarchate, of the Ukrainian uh, part of the Moscow Patriarchate. He is a professor um, at the Huffington Ecumenical Institute uh, at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Uh, so currently he is uh, staying at home sheltering in place, or I think the policy in LA is being called better at home, um, over there in LA. So we're gonna ask him how that's going for him, uh, even while I shelter in place uh, on the other side of the world in Vienna, Austria. So I hope you find the conversation interesting. The reason I'm interviewing Father Kirill is because I had a few questions about an article that he recently wrote um, online uh, on a site called Public Orthodoxy. Check that site out and check out Father Kirill's article if you haven't heard about it yet. It's called COVID-19 and Christian Dualism. So he offers us some thoughts uh, as someone very erudite and learned in Orthodox theology. So um, I would like to foster on this show, my beloved zillions, an ability, right? and the opportunity to learn from one another and to open uh, certain topics for deeper understanding, things that maybe we took for granted, you know, uh, certain sacramental theological issues that maybe we have either misunderstood or perhaps not misunderstood, but not articulated as to, uh, you know, how we understand to the extent that we can understand certain mysteries, like the sacramental life of the church. We don't understand everything, right? And that's just fine. Uh, none of us do. But to the extent that we're invited to theologize, uh, we can grow in certain understanding. I, I wanna, before we talk to Father Kidil about his insights about, you know, he talks about the whole topic of, you know, when it has come up in recent, very recent times, uh, concerns for approaching Holy Communion when there is a danger of infection generally, you know, in our cities and in 
the whole world really uh, by you know the coronavirus. Um, the issue, a very contested issue, has arisen whether the uh, approaching of Holy Communion can possibly also pose, you know, uh, well, uh, you know, a danger to be infected. So uh, I think surrounding this issue is people's fear. In fact, it's been formulated like this, a fear to be labeled unfaithful or that you don't believe in the body and blood of Christ or of the real presence of the body and blood of Christ in the sacraments. So the posing of this issue in that way, I think has caused simply a false posing of the question. Uh, it's not an either or of your faith, you know, number one, hygienic guidelines and following them uh, is a matter of common sense that regardless of your faith is a necessity. We don't tempt God. We're not reckless. Our Lord himself did not throw himself off of the roof of the temple when the de devil was tempting him to do so because he says, if you are the son of God, that's like telling us, if you really believe in the son of God, then go ahead, throw yourself out the window. Would we do that? Uh, even if we had just received Holy Communion, if I want to pose this question ad absurdum, if I am just, you know, like I truly have received Holy Communion and I am told, now go and throw yourself out the window, would I do it? No. But if there is a physical reality, which is and was in the life of uh, the earthly mission of our Lord Jesus Christ, he truly was in the flesh, a perfect man and perfect God. But as man, uh, he def he didn't just seem to be, right? He was uh, flesh and blood. Uh, and so uh, the question being posed about the holy the gifts is, are they truly material or do they just seem to be these physical species? Do they become not physical species, but they seem to us to be physical and are they you know really material species that god is using he's using bread and wine it doesn't mean that it's not the body and blood of christ but he's using these physical material species of bread and wine and water is added it doesn't cease to be on the material level everybody on the material level bread and wine truly being the body and blood of Christ. Do you get that? This is why certain material realities still, you know, according to certain laws of nature, still happen to hold for the body and blood of Christ in the species as sacramentally they are used of bread and wine these are still physical realities, just like we approaching Holy Communion are a physical reality, even though there is a spiritual uh, dimension to us, right? And there is faith that is the assurance, not of things that we see, but of things unseen, as the author of Hebrews says, right? The author of Hebrews tells us that faith is the assurance of things not seen. So the invisible reality is this is the way sacraments work, my friends, through visible and familiar, uh, you know, material realities, like water. Will you drown in the, the baptismal water if somebody holds you down under it? You will. It's not because the baptismal water is not salvific for us to, well, both die and rise again, uh, which is what we do. We participate in the death and resurrection of Christ in holy baptism, but it doesn't cease to be water with its potentially in the event, right, in the event that it's used a certain way with its potential harm and danger to people. Okay, so the thing that we are charged with is not to tempt God and not to be reckless, but I want to remember a little story uh, about someone's uh, a little bit distorted faith in uh, communion in a, in a different way, in a different way, everybody, that was tested. It's a story, just listen up. 
it's a story that my mentor, Father Taft, shared with me many years ago. He said, you know, sometimes people believe uh, strange things about Holy Communion. Now, this was Father Taft, a very pious, very prayerful, and very, uh, you know, huge liturgist. Uh, liturgy was his whole life. Anyway, he says, he tells me this story. He says, when he entered seminary as a young Jesuit, they were very young boys, basically 17 years old. Uh, there was another young man who entered the seminary in the same year. And this young man became very disturbed and shocked when he heard somehow he had never realized that in the Catholic mass, because at that point Taft was, you know, doing the Roman uh, rite and was Roman Catholic without being Byzantine rite as he later became. Anyway, so this seminarian hears for the first time somehow he went through 17 years of his life not knowing that the host, you know, in the Latin mass, that it was actually some prepared somewhere and brought to the church, having been baked somewhere and then it was brought and, and so forth and used in the mass. He thought, somehow he thought, that it simply appeared on the pattern during the mass. He thought it was this miracle in that sense, miracle that it would just poof, appear, uh, you know, uh, for the mass, uh, you know, in church. And he was realizing, listening to some, I guess, instruction or a class, uh, on the mass. I really don't know how he didn't notice that it was being brought from elsewhere, uh, but Taft thought it was a funny story, which it is, I think, uh, you know, that he had always thought that. Now, because that's a false belief in the first place, uh, it's not testing, actually, it shouldn't be testing, right, this young man's faith to be told no, it is baked elsewhere, it is brought to the church, and then it's sanctified. But imagine this, that if you're believing something about the bread and wine that is uh, transfigured into the body and blood of Christ, sacramentally, my friends, um, if you're believing that somehow it turns into this not material or super material, um, uh, you know, uh, thing. Uh, I think it's unnecessary to feel that your faith is being tested. It's a false suppos supposition in the first place, you know, and you shouldn't, your faith uh, is not being tested because nobody claimed that this is not material. It's not through the material that we commune in the body and blood of Christ, you know, does that story make sense to you why I'm mentioning it? It was a misunderstanding. And now the church isn't lying that this is the body and blood of, blood of Christ. Of course not. It is the body and blood of Christ. But the whole radical part of Christianity is that God truly becomes flesh and he truly willed it for the church to work, right, sacramentally and for his work to be continued to be done through the material. All right. This is why. The body and blood of Christ uh, left or stored inappropriately, right, the holy gifts, uh, can in certain cases, you know, uh, become covered uh, with mold. And the first time I heard that, I'll admit that, you know, I, I was quite young, but I, that was a very surprising to me. But it's not counter to the faith of the church that God in his humility willed it to work with the material to use that which is familiar to us. And he indeed made himself that vulnerable that he could even die. It didn't seem like he suffered and died on the cross. He really did. But the world in which we are left to, you know, make the journey of our salvation is vulnerable. And we are susceptible also as church. We're not these invincible beings. We're not promised that on our cross-carrying journey, all right? This is my point. So we'll listen to Father Kidiel, uh, and I hope everybody's well. Uh, don't get upset, everybody, all right? Uh, we uh, are enduring a certain crisis now, all of us, and uh, this uh, particular topic is something 
we just want to uh, dedicate some time to uh, and try to come to better understanding. All right, well, those are just a few words I wanted to share with you. Let's think about it a little bit. In any event, don't get upset. Uh, just go on if this doesn't interest you. I love all you people. And now let's talk to Father Kidiel. Hello, Father Kidiel. Thanks for coming on. Hello, thank you for inviting me, for having me here. Of course. It's, a to be here. <laughs> it's my honor, Father Kidiel, as always. Listen, we want to talk about your article. Uh, but first of all, why don't you tell us how you're doing? I think we all want to know how you're surviving in uh, LA. How strict are I, the rules? I enjoy myself being a recluse, at least for, for a short, short while, after long trips and many trips. And um, I'm at bay now. Enjoy it every, every, every second of being here. Uh, we are not supposed to, uh, to go out much, even though we, we can. We have a regime which was imposed uh, upon us, upon the uh, inhabitants of Los Angeles by the state and by the city of, of, of Los Angeles. They call it uh, safe at home, uh, meaning that it's better to stay at home, but we, we still can go outside and people take their walks, um, their rides, bike rides, so I do sometimes. Um, otherwise, it's, it's quiet, it's, it's not crowdy, it's pleasant, weather is good, so uh, it's uh, indeed an opportunity, a, a time for many opportunities for spiritual, if you want, growth, uh, intellectual reflections uh, to do, you know, to meet all the deadlines that, that we sometimes don't meet uh, in submitting articles, uh, writing pieces. So it's actually, I, I, I envisage a, a boom in scholarly publications after, after this crisis, so the the journals, uh, magazines will be, I think, flooded with, uh, you know, submissions, texts. Right. Uh, so, yeah, this is the, the positive side of it. All right. Well, I'm glad you see it that way. So you're enjoying this. I guess uh, for those of us who do live alone, it's life doesn't change all that much. That's true. That's true. I do feel, uh, you know, very bad for those people who, uh, well, maybe don't work intellectually. They're saying that this is very good for those people who work intellectually, you know, that they could do what they do from home. But you do go out, like you said, for bike rides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have wonderful paths uh, for biking along the ocean and uh, they're not crowded uh, anymore and they're really pleasant. I've noticed when I do go for my walk here on the Danube Canal, it's not exactly the ocean, but it's the best I've got. Uh, <laughs> people, you know, people try to keep Avoid their- Avoid each other, yeah. But I noticed that there's, there can be an unpleasant kind of just social feeling, especially if people like turn away from each other. And uh, it's, it's been noticed, uh, I noticed it, but I heard someone else say it somewhere online that, you know, you don't have to like scowl and turn away, <laughs> even though you keep your distance. Maybe you could smile at people and from a distance, you know, say hello. And I find I've been trying to practice that and it's a little bit less, you know, stressed the atmosphere with- Oh, that's true. You know, I noticed the same uh, when I walk and I, I see a stranger approaching me. Usually it's, it's, it's very usual here, even in Los Angeles to say hello to each other, even the person is a, a complete stranger. Uh, and uh, I, I caught myself in the feeling and in the thought that uh, I, I, yes, I, I better avoid that person, but then I, 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 I think that I, and I say to myself, it doesn't mean that I, I don't have to smile or to, or to say hello, you know, even remotely. And I, I see the same feelings in that person. So yeah. we kind, we kind of, yes, we try to keep our social distances. At the same time, we try to sometimes struggling to uh, preserve some humanity, you know, in uh, be to remain humane in our attitude to each other. So yeah. it's a good exercise in many senses. Uh, sometimes we just forget about, you know, those nice things that we need we need to to show to each other, and it's a, it's time to revisit them if you want to rethink them. And uh, people, I think, uh, do it well. Yes, yes. I, well, I, I don't see that we're always doing it well, uh, but it's still all very new. Uh, but people are, I think, beginning to, there's a certain, I don't know, let's call it the pandemic, like etiquette. We could call it the pandemic it, 
you know there's going to yeah, be this a good, yeah yeah thank you for pointing this uh, this one i think it's very good it's very fitting and yes on the other side of the of the uh, um, of this pandemic on the social relations is uh, there is an increase in violence uh, people even in california uh, which is very kind of open minded and, and and so forth uh, there there were cases when the there were outbursts of aggression against, especially against Chinese people, you know, and they were some some of them were even beaten uh, without uh, uh, indiscriminately, uh, indiscriminately, and uh, those are bad things. And I think it's uh, indeed it's a time of temptations. It's a time time. It's a time of for check ourselves for our to check our spiritual kind of uh, status, if you want, and to observe ourselves to watch ourselves better in order to avoid all those negative. Uh, consequences of isolation or restrictions, and to exercise and probably to add some uh, some uh, good Christian skills as a result of this uh, of this story. I've learned two things um, from this that I think God is trying to teach me. Number one, smile at Chinese people. Yeah. And then number two, I see you took that seriously. Number two, don't eat bat. <laughs> yes, especially during the land, which well, does mean that we need to break the land necessarily, because to eat good can be a very lentil thing, <laughs> right? You know, it doesn't matter how many times, you know, I've had that sneaking thought, that urge, you know, to go and just munch out, you know, or, or pick out on one of those little juicy bats, but no longer yeah. am I visited by this thought. It's just gone. So I feel like uh, we have been liberated from so certain uh, dangerous and dark instincts. So let's be grateful for that. I hope you notice, Father Kirill, before we begin, that in solidarity with you and your state, I am, you know, I'm drinking my matcha tea, actually, from this mug, California Republic. I really appreciate it. I, I, I noticed it and I, I, I enjoyed that you, you chose this mark for, for this uh, recording for, uh, for our conversation. In um, uh, uh, reciprocity, I just want to say that I'm also drinking my matcha. Um, it's, though it's not a California Republic mug. Um, I brought it from Japan and uh, I really enjoyed it during the, during the land. It's really, well, Japanese food is usually very lentil and very uh, ascetical, I would say. Um, and uh, I was inspired from your previous presentation. I, I follow your, your program, of course, and I, I also ask my students to follow your program. Your program. You uh, can't recommend matcha tea? Yes, the program when you recommended matcha tea. And uh, uh, I also make, especially now that we have uh, our teaching online, uh, I make assignments to my students to watch your, your show, and they, they really love it. So thank you again for, uh, for this opportunity that you give to my students. Well, thank you, Father Kirill. As a you side know, note. I, I, do, <laughs> I do pay you well, so I certainly hope you recommend my show. So listen, uh, as uh, we approach the topic of your uh, study or your article, uh, could you tell me uh, 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 some of your thoughts on this, I think, aspect of some people's approach to going, you know, to insisting uh, to on going to church. Uh, and I'm not evaluating, ev evaluating this right now as good or bad, and approaching Holy Communion, say, without safeguards of a certain type that our churches have now uh, added to the right. Um, some people seem to have this approach to it, like it's a it's a confession of faith or like a martyrdom almost, you know, to show that I'm going to show up and I approach Holy Communion as usual, uh, as if this is a sign of witness or martyrdom. And if someone uh, abstains, uh, a little bit to suggest that that's a sign of a weakness or lack of faith. Could you talk to this? Yeah. Yes, yeah, thank you for asking this question. It's really important, and it it really cons uh, it's a, a concern for many people. Uh, I agree with you, and I also observe uh, those concerns in on on on, uh, on social media and so forth. Um, so it's important. I'd like to uh, highlight three points regarding this. First point is that uh, I think it's completely wrong to uh, perceive uh, uh, such practices as a kind of martyrdom. It's not martyrdom. 
uh, and I really, uh, very unfortunately, I heard even voices that said that if you go and you get, uh, you know, infected and you die, this will be a, a, a death of martyrs. This is completely wrong. Uh, there is a, a basic distinction between martyrs and and um, terrorists. If you <laughs> allow me to, to bring this parallel, you know, martyr is a, a martyrdom is a very it's not just a Christian thing. Uh, it, it happens in many other religions. In Islam, martyrs are known as shahids. In our language, common language, we perceive shahids as, you know, as terrorists, but they're essentially martyrs. Mm. And the original uh, idea of martyrdom is that uh, people uh, are ready to sacrifice their own lives for the sake of their faith, of their beliefs. Right, and we know that many martyrs died in this way. Some of them didn't die, and we know them as confessors. They just confessed their faith. They suffered, but they survived, and then they they are confessed and so forth. But it's it's the, the idea is the same that the, I am ready, prepared to sacrifice my life for the sake of my faith, for what I believe. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this idea has become distorted in terrorism, in religious terrorism, when people are ready to sacrifice their life for the sake of their belief together with the lives of other people. So they, they take with them the lives of other people, either consciously, uh, deliberately, or, or, or unconsciously, as I say, as, as I would say. Uh, so in this case, what we have, we have um, uh, uh, a kind of um, uh, Instruction, inspirations. Well, well, people claim, people urge other people go to the church, whatever it takes. Uh, take communion there. Be in touch with other people. If you die, you will be a martyr. But essentially, what happens with the virus, you will take with you a lot of other people. You may not die yourself, but other more vulnerable people may die. And I, in my, in my kind of classification, taxonomy of you know ethical. Uh, deeds, uh, this is, uh, formally speaking, this is terrorism. I know people don't want to kill other people, right? But they should know, and they know that they expose to danger of dying other people when they, they do this, uh, um, following the, you know, the uh, invocations to martyrdom, you know, to confessing your faith and so forth. This is dangerous. This is terrorism, religious terrorism. Right. That is one point. Yes, if you want to comment on this, and I'd like to, and then I will pass to, to, to other points that I wanted to make. Thank you, Father Kidil. Now getting a little bit more specific about the topic of your article. Uh, talk uh, to us about uh, how you see this belief uh, mm -hmm. that well, approaching Holy Communion can't possibly uh, infect one with the virus. Yes. Um... Uh, answering your question, I'd like to come back again to the to other two points that I mentioned in the beginning because they are related to your question. Uh, what kind of faith it is that people are ready to sacrifice themselves, and uh, uh, what kind of faith brings them to uh, brings them to uh, to the church? Uh, well, first, it is certainly it is a belief in the uh, in the reality of the body and, and uh, blood of Christ, and I think this is the bottom line of everyone. We we do believe all of us that this is the true body and true blood of Christ, uh, which um, we partake of uh, during the Eucharist, and we must do this as Christians. This is essential. This is the bread and and uh, and blood of life, the bread of life that we participate. Uh, it is essential for our spiritual growth, for our salvation, for our deification. All the purposes of the Christian life can be achieved only through the Eucharist. It's a condition sine qua non. No doubt about this, right? Uh, then some nuances uh, come up uh, regarding uh, regarding this, and I would uh, um, I would uh, speculate probably about some of the um, uh, motifs that that bring people additionally to the, this, the common denominator that I mentioned. Um, for some people, uh, church, is, uh, church is a very special place. In which sense? In a sense that I mentioned in my article, uh, uh, which um, uh, was upheld by, by, dualists, by dualists. 
those are people, uh, they flourished in the early Christian centuries and they believe that there are special places on earth uh, where you have a special access to salvation. Actually, they believe that that is the only place where you have an access to salvation. Uh, I studied in, in detail a movement which flourished in the from the second century and continued for several centuries. It's, more, uh, it's called Montanism. It, it flourished in, in Asia Minor. Uh, they had the center in what is now Turkey. It's a province called Ushak. It's really in the middle of nowhere. And nowhere even tourists don't go there. I went there though. <laughs> and I was probably the only tourist there. And I found actually the place where Montanis, which Montanis believed to be, you know, the new, the heavenly Jerusalem, a special place uh, where they thought if you go there, your, your salvation is secured. So was it, was it very special? It was actually, it's, it was nothing. It was just a hill, <laughs> mountains, you know, deserted completely. Even the taxi drivers that brought me there, they didn't know about this place. I, I learned about this place from, you know, from the scholarly book, books, they discuss, uh, this, from the scholars who discovered it. So essentially it's, it's not, no access to it, no roads, nothing. It's really wilderness, you know, it's wild. And Montanis believed that this is a unique place on the, on, in the world. If you go there, you get saved what, whatever it takes. If you step outside, you perish, you die spiritually. And you don't see the difference between that place and another place, just another mountain, the mountain next to that one, where they believe that if you go there and stay in that, at that mountain, you will die. If you stay at this mountain, you will be saved. This is a dualistic kind of approach to, uh, to, to the space. And I believe that uh, some, uh, still some Christians uh, have this uh, idea that the church is the only place where you go and you get saved. If you are cut off from the church, even for you know, a couple of weeks, they consider it as a, a spiritual threat. You know, or a, you know, a conspiracy theory that Masons or whatever uh, uh, want to, you know, to detach uh, Christians from, from their churches and to make them you know, die spiritually, make them pe perishing. I, I believe this is, this is one point, one thing that I would like to underline. The churches are important. We have to go to the church, right? They are places for our, our meetings, for our gatherings. But as such, they are not... Yeah. Okay. Can I speak to that point? I, I don't yes, want. To, I, I want to hear more from you, but I want to interject something. So you are identifying this as this kind of attachment to a certain space, like a sacred space. You're not saying that it has to do with the actual uh, getting something, you know, physical. Yes, for for some people, for some people, it's about the space. It's not really. It's not only about the Eucharist. It's you also about the churches. I really don't notice that it's about the church space because people do not, by and large, the overwhelming majority only comes to one service and that is when communion is being distributed, whether it's the pre-sanctified, which is much less frequent, yeah. so to say, or the divine liturgy, but to matins, to vespers, I don't think it's news to anyone that these services are almost completely non-existent, except with maybe one exception and only because you're getting something like on Palm Sunday when they'll come to the part where they- Yes, then in this case, what prevents people from receiving communion at homes? That is my third point that I wanted to make. That we are accustomed to take our communion in a church, right? And uh, we uh, go to the church, which is nowadays a public space. That's why the churches are closed down because they are public spaces, just like other public spaces, right? And uh, we have a custom to, to go to a church as a public space, and this is a relatively new thing. Well, it is a thing that has been established since uh, the fourth century. For us, for Eastern Orthodox Christians, it's a new thing because we still have memories, you know, institutional memories or confessional memories, if you want, uh, from the early centuries as well. So it's a new thing. Before that, uh, the situation was different, the practice was different, and you as a liturgical scholar, uh, of course, know uh, about this, about this, that originally, the original communities met at homes, and uh, it's another experience of mine that I would like to share. Uh, there is um, uh, an example uh, of such a community which was discovered in the beginning of the 20th century, um, 
uh, in Dura Europos, in what is now Syria. It's the eastern part of Syria on the banks of Euphrates River. And um, uh, this was a community that existed before the, uh, before, uh, the city uh, of uh, Dura Europos, which was kind of par, uh, half Parthian, half Roman. Um, uh, was destroyed in the middle of the third century. And they destroyed this city in the, in, uh, in, in the same way uh, uh, as um, in, in the way that they actually preserved the, the structure of the city. They just put, you know, earth on top of it. And it was buried under, under the layer of earth. So uh, the buildings essentially survived and, in, and they included the, uh, a Jewish synagogue, uh, Mithraum, the temple of Mithras, Mithras, and a Christian church. So the Christian church was essentially a household. It was a home, private home, which was converted for Christian gatherings uh, congregate, uh, for the congregation. They, they would come to the church, uh, to that home essentially, would take communion, be together. Um, and uh, they, then they would you know, uh, go to their homes. But essentially it was a home. And this was a uh, the same kind of home that apostles visited when they preached the gospel. Because we know from the from the scripture the apostle, that apostles first uh, visited households, you know, big families, and uh, they preached there. Then that those families converted, and they constituted the core of the original of the, of the first communities in many in many cases. So uh, it means it brings us now to this idea that we don't we do not necessarily need to, need to meet at homes. Uh, I mean, in churches we could meet at homes. And this would be a, a kind of, uh, it's, it's permissible. It, it doesn't mean that we have to, to switch altogether, you know, to a, a completely different way of doing liturgy, you know, at, at our homes. But it means that in our past, in our anamnesis, the Christian anamnesis, we had a practice of, of celebrating liturgies, of uh, praying together at homes, something that we are forced to do now. Therefore, nothing prevents us now uh, from having uh, our services at our homes, what prevents us from inviting a priest or a bishop or a patriarch, those, why not, uh, to our family to celebrate our liturgy and to take communion, not in the church, but at our homes. Of course, we need to be conscious. It, it doesn't eliminate the risk of, of contamination uh, completely, but it reduces the risk of contamination, right? And um, it also... Um, we also need to be conscious not to invite you know all el the priests you know are vulnerable but maybe younger priests who, who would do the same so that is my point that uh, younger, we could have younger, younger patriarchs or younger patriarchs yes true <laughs> maybe that's why we have to have younger pat patriarchs <laughs> uh, we had you know in the in early modernity they had even patriarchs uh, in their 30s early 30s like uh, patriarch um, uh, the Cephas of Jerusalem. He was really almost well a teenager <laughs> uh, when he was elected a patriarch. But it's a different story. Uh, my point is that uh, my point is that uh, sometimes people are attached to the practices, to the common practices, and they're upset to um, uh, to change those practices. Not because of the liturgy per se, not because of the Eucharist per se, but because of other reasons that I mentioned, like the attachment to a place as the, the church as a place or to the attachment of to the church as a public uh, of uh, to the church as a public place and uh, the why well, the, the, this story with the virus uh, uh, gives us a, a lot of uh, food for thinking or rethinking about our practices liturgical first and second about the domains of our physiological thinking yes. it's an opportunity for us to you. Back, yeah. I, I want to steer you now uh, yeah. to, uh, to talk about what the essential shift is here, uh, the essential shift that you're making in your thinking of the way the church uh, comes together, right? I think uh, that you're trying a little bit, I don't want to be leading the witness here, but that there is a focus on the community. The community is sort of the gathering exactly. place. Yeah, you get it. The yeah. focal point. And then um, the minister of the community is one who, it's not, we're not go going to be hosted by him, right? He's actually exactly. coming uh, and serving uh, in that community, right? 
that's a very good point. Thank you for, for uh, making this uh, observation, which is absolutely correct. You, you, you uh, caught uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, that is the original meaning of the community in the first place, uh, of the Christian community in the apostolic era. The community was the basis of the church, and all the ministries, including the apostolic ministry, including the apostles, imagine, including Christ himself, they served the community. Christ served the community of the apostles, effectively, and he taught apostles to serve other communities. And uh, all the structures of the church, have, that is... He didn't have his own house. He, he said, you know... That's true. He visited, God. exactly, exactly. He visited, he visited the, the house of the fathers, house. including Peter. At that time, the house of Peter, whom he visited, was such a place for a, for a community meeting, right? It was a home. It was not the temple of Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, it was just a private, private home. And this is a model for us in our times of, uh, of trouble. And I think uh, this, is, this is about the ethos of, of ministry, essentially. The, the original ministry, uh, ethos of ministry was exactly to serve the community. Now, then with the passage of time, it changed to the, to, the, to the extent that the community became the servant to the ministry. And it reflects, it is reflected even in the fact that we go to the church, you know, to take communion. Not the priest comes to us to bring us communion, something that happened in the early, uh, you know, in the early age. Uh, I don't that say that we... Also, that would also, uh, uh, you know, mean more service from our part, because we have to, to be a host, you really have more work to do. You're, exactly. Yeah. The, the large uh, burden of the work is on you, and your guest is honored, and but also, yes, he's serving, uh, but in in an increased way perhaps and again i want to underline as we're talking about this that it's not like yay let's not have churches it's not this iconoclastic you know uh no no that's that's exactly yeah yeah that's very correct it's important to make this uh footnote yes it's not about you know changing altogether everything it's about um accommodating ourselves to the challenge of the time and my point is that in our past in the past of our church, we have plenty of resources that help us to accommodate ourselves to the challenges of the time. Right. It doesn't mean that we need to switch to, you know, to new practices to be of nobliance or whatever. Uh, it means that uh, we have plenty of resources in our past. Probably other traditions don't have the same richness as, as we do, and we just need to use them. Right. That, that we might rediscover these good and wonderful things that we have, like church spaces, like the church structures, that for a time, for whatever reason that God knows is good for us, right, are, we're denied right now uh, in, on several levels, you know, and that we might perhaps, uh, yes, I think rediscover the essence of them you know, that might be lost because of the externals. Exactly, exactly. Yes, we have accustomed to our customs so much that we lost the sense of them to a great extent. And now this virus uh, thing, the epidemic, uh, it uh, gives us an opportunity. It does not secure, but it gives us a, an opportunity to reconsider many things and to revisit them and to rediscover the original meanings of many things, many practices, including liturgical practices, and including the very meaning of the Eucharist, after all. Coming what? back to your question, to your original question, why people come, what kind of uh, expectations do they have when they come to the church for, the, for to take Eucharist? Uh, indeed, uh, just like uh, many have adopted those dualistic ideas in our, you know, about the place, they've uh, adopted magic ideas about Eucharist. And uh, I think it is uh, really a layer above the original meaning of Eucharist, which is a lion to the Eucharist per se, and which it should one? be, you know, what, 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 which is what? It's a layer, it's a layer of senses, as it were, kind of meaning, which is above the original meaning of the Eucharist, which was added to the Eucharist in the centuries, you know, uh, uh, afterwards, after, after the early Christianity, after Eucharist was established and so forth. And uh, I think some layers in our perception of the Eucharist are really a lion uh, to, uh, to the Eucharist. And <clears throat> This magic uh, perception of the Eucharist is exactly uh, an aberration of the original view uh, about Eucharist that uh, that uh, the apostles had or the fathers of the church had. Uh, moreover, in our own past, in very recent past, 
well, it's not the first uh, epidemic that we have. We have many epidemic uh, cases in our past, and we just need to rediscover how the church faced those challenges, those epidemics, right? And we even, you know, from the 19th century, if you take the history of the Russian Empire, there were diseases, you know, all sorts of contaminated, you know, um, uh, epidemic uh, cases and, 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 and things. And the churches, uh, well, faced them in a very reasonable and sane way. They made, they uh, took all the necessary measures, you know, to prevent from the dissemination, from the spread of the disease, diseases. Uh, epidemies, uh, viruses, and so forth. They didn't know about the reasons, of course, but they, uh, to the same extent as we do, but uh, they really understand, uh, understood um, the danger and they tried to, con uh, to contain those reasons of danger as much as possible, including the restrictions in the practices of, uh, you know, distributing Eucharist and, and so forth. And no one said that, well, it's a sort of magic, you, it, you go, whatever it is, regardless, uh, what happens to you and uh, partake of the commune. And again, they, they knew about science much less than we do. And this is the paradox. We know about, about science much more. And still we are much more under the spell of this magic uh, and uh, ignore science. This is, this is really a paradox that, that I cannot explain. Could you? Uh, so, to I think it's. Yeah. Okay. So, you, uh, I'd like for you to tell our viewers. Uh, how you pointed out that uh, I want to get to the bottom of certain questions that I have about what you said. Uh, you pointed out about the dualism when you specifically took something like the virus, right? You talked about the virus not being ontologically somehow evil. Evil isn't yeah. really a thing anyway, according to uh, you know Christian traditions both in East and West. Uh, evil is not something that God creates, right? So. Uh, evil has to be a free choice, right? Or at least a vacuum of someone not being interested in good. Now that cannot possibly be true about say a mosquito or uh, even less so about a virus, right? Uh, so I want you to tell us about this. I'm beginning to tell about it. Uh, this, this idea that you have, and then the part that confuses me when you, when you explain that, you know, there's a human being there's another life form that is like a virus. And then you, I'm, I'm getting ahead of, of, of what you're gonna say. No, 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 that's good, it's helpful. Just let me, yeah, uh, complete that thought. It really confuses me when you say, and nonetheless, I myself approach, but I think whoever approaches should do it in full knowledge that uh, if the virus is, is there and being passed on, which is possible, people should know that through Holy Communion, but they, we, I still approach knowingly. I don't understand this part that if, if one understands that the virus can be passed on, why would you insist on I still approach? Then to me, that sounds like some kind of martyr to my Yeah, contradiction, yeah. I see your point. Uh, well, first of all, uh, that is another wonderful discovery that uh, we had to make as a result of this uh, 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 pandemic, uh, the discovery of, uh, of Christian Neoplatonism. <laughs> it's, uh, well, it, 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 it sounds like very jargon, of course, uh, and people just would probably would uh, turn off their, you know, their, their monitors uh, uh, when I, just when I said this phrase, Christian Neoplatonism. But indeed, that was an interesting thing in, in the history of our tradition, which helped us to fight dualism in the past. Uh, dualism was widely spread in, in, in both Eastern and Western Christianity. Uh, it was commonly a common belief, not just among the Montanists, but, uh, uh, well, and not, not just among the Manichaeans, but it was widely uh, believed in, in, in the congregations, in the church in the, in the past. I mean, late antiquity. Primarily. Give us the simple explanation of dualism, because I don't think everybody will follow this. Yeah, yeah I, I explained it briefly in my article, but I, I have to do it properly now. Well, dualism is it's, it's essentially about, it's a black and white outlook at the world. Uh, when a person sees the world as being divided into two parts, one part is essentially ontologically good, and another one is essentially ontologically bad. Uh, the ontological, uh, ontologically good uh, uh, 
part of the world is a part of, of matter. It's a matter which is kind of sanctified, which is you know purified. And the ontologically bad thing is a matter which brings us down. Uh, this the dualistic. Um, uh, th this is an ancient belief, which which is which was prior to Christianity, and uh, uh, there were beliefs that um, uh, the world was created by two gods. Essentially, good God created a good part of the world; bad God created a bad, dark part of the world. It's uh, in modern times. I sometimes explain to my students: it's not like you know matter and dark matter, as the scientists sometimes say, because dark, dark matter is still good matter. Even though it is not, you know, uh, reported uh, by uh, by uh, by scientific um, um, uh, appliances, uh, uh, but the the dualistic idea is is the same that there is dark part of the world, bad, essentially bad. Which, if you touch it, if you participate in it, you get contaminated with this darkness. You get in, infected or affected by this darkness, and that's why you have to avoid the bad part of the world. In order to to be uh, on the good side of the world, in the good side of the world, as it were, and um, um, so this idea was fought by by the church. Uh, this idea, nevertheless, was never uh, uh, was never uh, won over. It always survived in the church. There were many ideas uh, or many kind of phenomena in the church history which were underpinned by this dualistic idea. Like imagine. In the West, uh, the perception of the black people, uh, dualism essentially, I believe, underpins racism, because people believe that if you are a black per person, you're, you're you're kind of you are of secondary kind of you know human being, or this was the idea that underpinned in the antiquity and then underpinned uh, the gender inequality, because people believe that if you are a woman, you are of inferior nature. Your nature is different, and this nature is badly affected by sin, by evil. Therefore, I have to abstain from women. You know that was a motivation for many, you know, dualists. Exactly because they they were abstaining actually from all sort of carnal, you know, uh, intercourses and uh, and and food and stuff because they believed that they abstained from them because they believed that they are essentially ontologically bad, and they didn't oh, want to. to be I have to mention that I didn't mean that bats are bad ontologically. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. No. 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 They That's are good. black. They're black. But I didn't mean that in a racist way either. Okay. Go yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. I, I had to. I had that, to. Well, that's my point. That uh, dualism uh, took different forms in the history of Christianity, and usually those forms were bad. Can I just underline in what you're saying, Professor? I <laughs> want to underline for the viewers that. The main crux of what Father Kirill is saying, I'm sorry that I'm translating, it's not a translation, uh, is that evil in that picture is not so much, it's, it's not the fact that it's contaminating, it's that it's divinized, that it's on an equal footing with the good. The divinization in paganism, right? The dualism that, that results from seeing yeah. evil as a thing, as essential, makes it also divine because it's a first cause like it's 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 not just the absence you can put of it in this way you can put it in this way yeah and uh essentially um because this... you know, i think that in our form of piety particularly in the home countries but you know there's a strong sense of demonology and it seems like all of church life is about the negative aspect of protecting warding off you know the holy yeah. water thing a community exactly is really just like a stronger form of holy water because it's exactly. also, the function is to be that protection. But exactly. the, the positive aspect, because I do agree that we need a certain distancing, we need Lent, we need, you know what I'm saying? We need the kind of negative kind of uh, warding off. But when all of our faith is that, and there's none of the positive of growing and nourishing and and developing you know what i'm saying like yeah. the actual the positives growth um yeah. then it becomes lopsided and instead of having any growth ever there's just this defense like all of our piety is a defense mechanism you know that's true you get it very well and i, I completely agree with you yeah. and that is the, the side effect of, of of dualism again and the dualism was uh, condemned by the, our church when the church condemned those who abstain from marriage for instance or abstain from you know food certain foods because they despise them 
one has not to despise things from which uh, he or she abstains, but should abstain because of the ascetical practices for self-restriction. It's almost a stoic idea, essentially. And, um, uh, uh, and dualism. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And my point in the article is that exactly the same dualism sometimes affects our perception of this virus and affects our perception of the Eucharist versus vis-a-vis virus. Because people believe that because virus causes bad to our health, can kill us, it is something like an essential evil, right? And the essential uh, ontological evil cannot be uh, passed through the Eucharist. That is the point. And that's why people believe that if they participate in the Eucharist, they cannot be affected by the virus. And the answer to this question exactly provided is provided by the Christian Neoplatonism. The old versions, you know, editions of, near, of uh, dualism in the past that I mentioned, they were uh, contested by Christian Neoplatonism. The main point of the Christian Neoplatonism, among them, the most important figures were people like Sido uh, Dionysius the Areopagite, Augustine in the West, um, uh, people like Maximus the Confessor, people like John of Damascus, so they really the authoritative fathers of the church, and they were the followers of this line. And their point was exactly that's why in my article I quote Maximus because he is quite kind of and Dionysus because they're crucial uh, for this perception. And their point was that essentially the dualistic uh, outlook is wrong because it, it presupposes that some parts of the created world are ontologically, essentially, physically bad, evil. It means that God, of course, the Christian uh, dualists, they believe that there is one God, unlike non-Christian dualists who believe that there were two gods, right? Christian dualists believe that there is one God, but they imply that this bad part of the world has been created by God himself. Or they imply that bad pieces, bits and pieces of the world, which became evil, they were kind of recreated by devil, by demons. They presuppose creative power in demons. The demons can create things equal, equally to God. And this is a blasphemous thing, blasphemous idea from the perspective of the Christian, uh, Christian uh, Neoplatonism. And this is exactly what I, I mean by saying that this is a dualistic perception of the virus. If we believe that virus is an evil thing, which has been, you know, distorted by sin or uh, a result of the distortion by sin or demons or, you know, or, or humans and not a thing just like other parts of the created world. We presuppose that evil has power to create something essential, ontological, like vir virus. And this is a wrong idea. This diminishes the creative power of God. You see? Uh, that's why my point, and I just follow the line. It was so natural for me because, well, you know, I studied Christian Neoplatonism. I wrote, I read those fathers, and it was, I was not, I was really surprised when people, when I realized that people think that virus is a bad thing, as an evil thing. It's not. It's a part of the creation. It's a part of the, this world, and uh, uh, it should be treated as a part of this world. And in our everyday life, other viruses. There are many viruses, not just you know uh, this coronavirus they don't affect us or sometimes they even may can do, uh, do good things to us right to our body they are in, an intrinsic part of our could existence you mention, could you mention the penicillin that is in like well penicillin is not exactly a virus it's a, a microbe it's a no. different kind of no. life of, uh, it's, kind it's of life. life it's a life form but yes it's a life form just like virus exactly and uh, that's exactly what I we didn't always know i'll be right back um we didn't always know that right no, we didn't. We didn't. So, um, can we talk about? Okay, can we talk about uh, this? The following aspect: when we're faced with uh, harmful, say, let's let's at least say that there are life forms that, in certain combinations with us, like the coronavirus, uh, if we're elderly or have pre-existing conditions, can be the de deadly for us, right? Uh, so, uh, here's what I want to ask. Well, just as many other things uh, can be deadly for us. If we overeat something good, right? And I'm going to lose my thought. Listen, so Go ahead. What, Sorry. there's another aspect to this. Let's leave alone or set aside uh, the fact that there are things that are potentially harmful to us. I completely agree that they're not 
per se evil, right? These life forms, say a shark. A shark is a wonderful, uh, amazing creature. Right? I just don't want to uh, go swimming uh, with sharks. <laughs> no, I swam with sharks. I swam, I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, you have powers that we don't know about um, because you're an Orthodox priest. So w nobody's surprised about that. Uh, so, uh, but sometimes it's hard to tell where's the priest, where's the shark. This is this. Exactly. <laughs> we have like bodies. We were like bodies with the shark. <laughs> Makes yeah. sense. Uh, no, but what fascinates me that I think is uh, th there's an element to this of uh, just in a very simple way, I'll say it escaping responsibility. Because there are elements like sharks, like the coronavirus, that call us to responsible action to you know, not be reckless, right? But instead of taking responsibility, we say, there's the magic uh, exactly. thing yeah. that, that will protect us without us putting any work into it. You know, just why don't you bless me with holy water and then I will go off and do whatever, you know? Yeah. To, to rescind responsibility seems to me like a big topic here because the infantilization of, I think, uh, orthodox right. piety. Well, well and said, yeah. Tell me, tell me how many or, or which prayer rule I should have. Tell me exactly how I should fast. Tell me, yeah. you know, certain things that really a responsible adult can only really decide with the full knowledge of their capacities, of their uh, family situation, of their physical uh, abilities. You know, with this coronavirus thing, it's like, look, adults, you now, here are the guidelines. You have to take responsible action, you know? But no, no, we have an easier way, you know? That we're gonna, we're gonna control also this, this magic. Uh, and I think there's a role that sometimes played, I don't wanna antagonize anybody, I really don't. But I think that when uh, the priest, you know, because priests do have uh, their ministry, but it, it's not the distribution of this, you know, like of that they have in their power, uh, the holy gifts, the only thing that can protect people, you know, rather than their responsible actions as well, right? And then a situation uh, evolves, I think, that can sometimes be, it's very subtle, and I'm not saying, you know, oh, our priests are evil. I'm saying that there can be a systemic tendency for it to be this way, that the priests are in the possession of this only thing that can save you, you know, in this situation. And in light of the fact that for most of history, the church has created, it's true, the church as an administrative structure has created enormous obstacles to receiving Holy Communion. There are a lot more things you know, that can bar you from Holy Communion, from, yeah. from not reading enough of the canons that are required before it, from not fasting enough before it, from having sex with the wrong person or people, um, from a lot of th things, you know, or being divorced, you know, or uh, in certain situations. Uh, uh, to say today that it's such a concern for us, I know I'm turning this a little bit. I don't want to turn away from your topic. I'm trying to stick with the topic of on the track don't worry it's a little bit of a different track we can cut that out I'm, I'm, no, no, no. but i do want to stick with this you know i think that all of that stuff that you have worked on and explained to us leads to really it's magic is always seeking the easy way it's saying oh you know i have an unrequited love right so i'm gonna go and get some uh whatever they're called you know like the magic um, you know, I think like it's an aphrodisiac or something to get the guy or the gal to fall in love with me. We have these stories in the lives of the saints, like Cyprian and yeah. Eustina, you know? Yeah. So if I have any challenge in life, uh, give me the magic formula, you know, rather than taking responsible action uh, and working for something or... Anyway, I've said enough, but I think that is, that is yeah. definitely a, a consequence a very practical consequence. This is at the core. Uh, this is at the core of the problem, I think, and you hit the core, uh, and I, I really appreciate it. 
And I think that is the, the danger of magic. Uh, the magic is dangerous not because it is, you know, it deals with demons and invokes demons and, and stuff. It, it is a bad thing about magic. It is dangerous indeed, yes. But uh, there is another thing which is really, really bad about magic because it's exactly, it, uh, it, 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 it uh, happens or a person uh, practices magic when he or she wants to get rid of his or her own responsibility to, uh, to, uh, to leave, uh, to lift up the, or, or how to say it better, uh, to essentially to denounce his or her own freedom and to ask other forces, including even God, you know, to replace my freedom with someone, something else. This is about magic. It does mean that we need to uh, seek the assistance of God. You know, we need to pray to God. Essentially, the Christian life is about synergy. It's about, you know, putting together the, uh, the human effort with the effort of, of, of God. And I very, very love very much uh, the image, a comparison which was, uh, was given by St. Paisius, uh, the Hagiorite, you know, the, the modern elder on Mount Athos. I really love it. And I usually, I usually quote it, that he says that all our efforts are about um, are about you know making zeros, you know drawing zeros, and all of them in some give zero, but then God comes, God God's grace comes and puts one in front of zeros, and then they receive weight. Magic is essentially is about uh, you know just looking for that zero to be put. Let someone else uh, draw that zero. Uh, excuse me, that one. We don't want to, to draw any zero, you know. We just want to, to, we wait for the miracle to happen to put this one, and this one in sum will be only one. It will be a, a small thing. But if we add our own zeros, then this receives more weight. And it's essentially about the synergy. It's about responsibility. It's about uh, invoking freedom, one's freedom. Magic is a very anti-freedom thing. Yeah. It's a very yes. anti-synergy thing. And it's, it's essentially... Uh, the way tyrants work, the way the way uh, you know, uh, you, you know, when people are living in fear, when people are disoriented, when people cease to uh, really, um, I think, have the power or feel the power, uh, they tend to look for uh, that uh, the, either a guru. Yeah, exactly. That's what I wanted to say, that we can have liturgical magic, it's one thing, but we can have also spiritual uh, magic, which is guruism. Yeah. When we uh, get rid of our own responsibility, of our own freedom, we bestow our own freedom upon others, or we expect others to replace our own freedom with their will. This spoils me as a receiver, because it uh, makes my uh, kind of will uh, at uh, atrophic, right? Yeah. Disable it. And it spoils the other person whose will, will becomes hypertrophic. This, this relationship between, say, a child, a spiritual child, and a, a spiritual guru, it leads to the situation when the will of the child is really small, becomes really small, hypertrophic, and the will of the guru, elder, studies, whatever, priest, yes. becomes really hypertrophic. Yes, and, and both that situations are healthy. The, the kind of freedom and responsibility to which you are calling. Uh, and, you know, I guess maybe there's a latent sort of, uh, I'm not sure it's always very relevant to mention ancient heresies, but sometimes it's helpful, like a monothelitism, you know, a certain degradation of human will of our capacity to make free and good choices. Uh, I want to say that somewhere I read uh, in some article that was about your article, a very recent article, accusing you of actually the opposite, of being misanthropic somehow. I was very surprised because I read your article. I am fairly, uh, fairly, you know, like uh, educated in these things. And uh, there's nowhere in your art article that I see misanthropy. I think that his idea was, well, I think his idea was just... I don't know. It wasn't a high level uh, article. I don't remember who wrote it. It's a name that says nothing to me, but it was, uh, you know, really seeing something in your article that wasn't there. And I think it's because if we could get back to this, you said, you know, that the human being uh, that you for one would still approach Holy Communion, or maybe you said it elsewhere, but it was, I think he was willfully trying to say, you know, distort and say, 
you're putting on the same level the value the of a human life and of the virus, and that somehow he was twisting this to say that, you know, you're changing the uh, anthropocentric, yeah, anthropocentric world yeah. and that you're putting viruses in humans and that somehow he was also twisting this to, to see that you're trying to make some like eco-friendly, you know, theology that somehow, and then it just went, it went like from here yeah. To like put me, put me on the same scale with Patrick Bartholomew, who is yeah. also Bartholomew, that it was all this conspiracy to support the evil because it was like a Russian source writing this. In some right. silly way, to me, in this time of crisis, oh my goodness, are we back there? I mean, I thought that these two weeks of the whole world now being, you know, really just focused on this, the prob the crisis of this virus, I thought maybe we will heal from those, like, you know, those divisions that were seem to be the focal point of uh, you know our yeah. church uh, yeah. existence well that's well that's a very good point sister uh, i really wanted to to just to uh, stay on this a bit uh because the problem we are facing now now let me do some uh, kind of mystagogy some mystical thing or some spiritual speculations if you if you uh, allow me to do i usually avoid okay, them but, but do uh, answer about the misanthropy I, I will, I will, I will. But I want just to make this very short remark. Uh, uh, now we face the problem of uh, deprivation of Eucharist, right? Something that we are discussing here. And the abundance of Eucharist that we had previously before the, the virus crisis uh, is gone all of a sudden, right? We have scarcity of Eucharist and we, we struggle, we fight, you know, to get some Eucharist, right? That is essentially the, the longing of, for many. Uh, and just let us remember, let us remind ourselves where we were a couple of weeks before the crisis. We were cutting Eucharist in every direction. We were breaking relations, you know, breaking Eucharistic com uh, communion with other churches, and we were essentially throwing Eucharist in the face of others. And my kind of very spiritual speculation, very unhealthy, mystical explanation of that, this, is, this may come from God. Because when we decide first to, you know, to cut communion, to break communion, God showed us now, look, what can you do without communion? Think about this. Don't do it again. And this is for us probably a lesson, an opportunity to reconsider our decisions about, you know, breaking communion and not to be kind of crazy, stupid people as, as we were in, uh, in, in well, doing that. Okay, well, one, just you hold on. Uh... Mr. Mr. Gaji, um, I think I have to cut that out, right? Um, I don't like when we're too specific about why God is doing this. You understand? Well, like, I know, I know this. Yeah, I usually do it myself. I, I, That's why I, I, I allowed myself this weakness. No, 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 no. I just want to say, you know, we all have our own pain also well, not everybody, but in that whole church politics thing, you know? So for either side to slip into, this is why God did it, because now you can learn your lesson. That's yeah. not good. I'm not going to put this I know, in. I know, I know, I know. That is, that's why I confess this is my weakness. This is my wrong idea, but uh, uh, that's what I think. Uh, no, it's not. I'm not even saying that it's not true, because uh, maybe that's exactly true, right? But I think the church has been actually throwing Eucharist uh, weaponizing the Eucharist for centuries, not just because of this. Uh, the church has been using it to, to wield control over people. Uh, it has been excommunicating. Nobody seems to care that I pointed out in my video that all of this is getting thrown out, but about considering women after childbirth uh, as yeah. unclean, you know, yeah. now they're all worried, oh, we're not feeding our people for th two weeks. Uh, please. That's total hypocrisy. And that is again, that is again, we started thinking about this again now in the wake of the of the crisis. Well, people just don't want to think in the direction of women. Nobody's saying that. That was just like... Yeah. But what you said people it. Said. Yeah, I said you it. Were, it. You were the instrument of God, probably. <laughs> as it says in that uh, Exodus, <laughs> you know? So... But I want to return to, to, return to your original question. Uh, why... 
I seem to contradict myself by saying that on the one hand, uh, you can uh, get infected by through the Eucharist. On the other hand, you have to, to approach the Eucharist, as I suggested. Well, I don't mean necessarily to go to the church for the Eucharist in the usual way as we do, which is really risky for your health. But uh, I think um, a new practices can be applied in receiving Eucharist, like inviting a priest with pre-sanctified gifts, or you know, to invite priests to celebrate the lit liturgy at home. This, this is also an option to approach the Eucharist. Uh, the point is not to go to the you know crowded places, uh, and I think this should be avoided. The point, my point, is to uh, to uh, participate in the Eucharist anyways. Or another option would be to keep Eucharistic gifts at home, just to invite the priest. To bring uh, some uh, spared extra, uh, you know, pieces of the Eucharist uh, to your home, and to keep those pieces at home, and then to take communion of them. Why not? Well, this is also about approaching Eucharist. Yes, but the idea of having just partaking of the Eucharist but not celebrating it is—it's—it's it's sacramentally strange. I think uh, these these practices. Uh, of not not just celebrating, but primarily of partaking of the Eucharist, right? Without even celebrating the Eucharist, it's very. Uh, th these practices are appropriate for the period of, of the Lent, when we know we ce we celebrate we celebrate, which is not really a celebration, right? Uh, the liturgy of, of the pre-sanctified gifts. We know the practices, the original practices, when the fathers and mothers uh, from the monasteries would go to the desert. We know the, the story of, of St. Mary of Egypt, uh, who never celebrated the uh, Eucharist. She, she, she no participated. Are, I, no mean, I mean, in the desert, yes. She, she yes, before, before, she, before she repented, she, she participated in the celebration, right, in Jerusalem. But then in the desert, uh, she never attended a liturgy. Someone and else brought and, the Eucharist. And she never partook of the holy gifts either for 48 years. So I'm just speaking... If we had a healthy awareness of our need for repentance, I, at least we always talk about it, right? We're supposedly a, a repenting church, right? Um, right? And why is it so impossible for us simply to accept this sort of epithymia for now? Mm -hmm. uh, she did it for 48 years, and I think a lot of us would agree. Anyway, I, I should only speak for myself, but I, I think she was probably more... Uh, better prepared, at least after a year or two, <laughs> totally, you know, in the desert, um, to approach, and yet she didn't for 48 years. I'm not saying that this is the way we would plan it or the way we would want it, but we haven't planned it. And I just think that this kind of, you know, uh, I don't know, one senses almost, uh, you know, one senses almost a, a panic, you know, that we're being yeah. barred. I'm just thinking, are we a little bit in denial, you know, of how we approach this? You know, in this yeah. insistence on these translated live services, to me, it's like, why wouldn't the laity now finally pick up the tools of the hours of, of you know, monasticism being a lay movement in the first place was substituting all the time those cathedral services, those church services with doing this on their own. And I think that, A, it raises what we fear so much, our responsibility, you know, of picking up and, and connecting with God as he's given you to do it at this time. Again, I'm not denigrating church service, you know, but it's, it's not disappeared because you, let's back up, I'm sorry, but you hear what I'm saying? I think it's a priest-centric. Uh, it is, it is very much. It is very much, and it, it is so, and uh, uh, that's, well, I consider really this crisis as, well, providential, if you want, uh, because uh, it uh, gives the church, us, many opportunities to, to rethink things that we thought are basic, and they are not, and uh, in, in effect, they, uh, they became uh, distortions in the century, the course of the century. They became what? Distortions. They became distortions. distortions. Right, right, right. So the distortions, the distortions became a norm, and I think this crisis now gives us an opportunity to reconsider those distortions, which became norms, norms, and to to, to go back to the norm. That's why uh, a crisis is a good thing. A crisis is exactly. a crossroads 
it comes from Karinian, right, to discern or decide. A crisis forces us into a decision that can either be very good for us or very bad. We we make a decision to grow because uh, one of the definitions of crisis uh, is that, that I like, I know there are several, many definitions of crisis, like there are many definitions of tradition. <laughs> Every right. who talks about it comes up with some new definition. But anyway, the crisis definition that I found somewhere, I don't remember where, was when old forms still exist in a system, but have ceased to fulfill their original purpose. So that you can have a marital crisis because the external you know, form is there. That, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but not the original feelings, yeah. Not the original exactly. Feelings, well, and original, uh, obligation, or whatever sense of purpose, uh, but in a systemic way in the church, I think certain of our sacraments might externally and indeed they're functioning, uh, but they are not fulfilling their purpose either because we have forgotten the symbolic language. You know, we have lost connection with what the tradition is revealing to us because a sacrament is a symbolic re presentation of a a, a truth of what God has done for us and continues to do. But if I don't get it, it's not only intellectual, I mean, but I might even have replaced it with a whole, whole, you know, like a different source, actually, of its power, uh, very subtly. And so we're forced to rethink certain things. And I don't think that we should be upset about it, or, you know, immediately angry, even that it would be discussed, say, by someone like Father Kirill or myself. Uh, it's not, uh, these questions are organically arising out of a God-given situation. And the fact that we're discussing it, I would urge us really not to uh, react to this uh, by being upset, but simply deepening uh, and uh, with a little patience, right? Ipomoni, a little bit sitting back, <laughs> remaining behind a little bit, with not exactly perhaps understanding, but uh, let's take pause is what I'm thinking. Father Kirill, uh, could you please give us a few additional thoughts and we're gonna wrap it up. I I think it's it's a good way to conclude our conversation, what you've said, and uh, Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your your points. And I agree with you that this is uh, is an opportunity to consider uh, things that um, uh, they seem to be, that seem to be established, but uh, they, Essentially, they've distorted the original meaning of uh, many things in, in our church, uh, including uh, liturgical kind of forms, including uh, ministerial forms and so forth. And this, we need to take, this is really kind of Lent, Lenten thing, right? Because in the land, we have to reconsider things that we were accustomed to. This is exactly what is happening. This is probably the, the only proper land that we have had for maybe for centuries, right? right? And uh, uh, let us not waste this opportunity. Let us uh, really think uh, thoroughly and deeply about what is happening and think about this from the Christian perspective. Let us think about, you know, spiritually uh, and theologically in in a very Christian way. And then we will be benefited immensely. There will be a resurrection, certainly. We will celebrate this resurrection, not just the resurrection of our Lord, but also the resurrection of you know, of our minds, of our souls, and uh, uh, everything that that is the purpose of of the land. Yes, thank you, because that uh, uh, I share that hope with you, Father Kirill, and uh, you've encouraged me personally in your approach to this, and I have spoken to you on one other occasion already throughout this uh, self-isolation, and I find you, your attitude, uh, to be both encouraging and healthy. And I thank you for your time. Uh, we did have some technical issues a little bit with Father Kirill getting this set up, but it's all turned out fine. Everybody have a blessed um, this weekend, whether it is the third weekend or the fourth weekend of Lent for you. We have all sorts of calendars floating about in the uh, coffee uh, you know, universe. I'll say that very humbly. Um, uh, So I'm saying goodbye, Father Kirill. You take care of yourself. Stay safe, stay home. Be well, be safe. Wash your hands for hours and hours, everybody. All right, bye, everybody. 